Hey everybody, Sean Tierney here from the Automation Blog and School, and in this episode of the Automation Podcast, I meet up with Kevin Wu from Siemens to learn all about the motion control capabilities of their CPUs, including their technology CPUs. Kevin, thank you for coming on the Automation Podcast to talk to us about motion control. Before you jump into your slide deck, could you first tell us a little bit about what your position is at Siemens? Thank you, Sean. Um, my name is Kevin Wu. Um, I've been with Siemens for roughly about 16 years, and uh, I went to many different roles at Siemens, but the currently right now, I'm the motion controller product manager for USA. So that's why the topic today is really all about motion. I won't get emotional about it. Let's just talk about motion, right? <laughs> <laughs> awesome. You know, we like to call it new world motion. And hopefully, you know, at the end of this um, kind of uh, presentation, um, podcast that you take away basically, you know, a new way of thinking about motion. So when we talk about motion, I always like to jump in. What is the typical motion application? So in here, we actually have a machine that's doing multiple uh, different motion applications here, and they're synchronized. They're uh, they're doing a converting application where you have a row that's basically being stretched with tension. And there's a lot of axes that are synchronized to each other. And then at the end, there's a pick and place, which is very common for all the machine machinery out there. And one thing with that, um, the cool thing I always like to say about this entire uh, motion application that's shown right here is that all these can be controlled with all one single motion controller. Okay, so that's kind of unique there. Um, so looking at this kind of complex um, machine here, I always like to jump in to talk about kind of build layers, the motion control application layer. So at the very bottom here, we always talk about the speed set point, which is, you know, the, from the motion complexity is the simplest, right? You typically have your pumps and fans, uh, your mixers, uh, your conveyor belts, you know, these are just kind of go, you know, on, off, go, um, really just speed set points. And that's all you really need to care about. Then a little bit more complex than speed set point is your positioning. So when you do positioning, I always like to say you're moving from A to B, B to C, C to D. Or you could go back to A and B, just move from A and B, A and B, A and B, back and forth. <laughs> Machine would never complain moving from A and B, A and B like human does. Um, so application like that, like the palletizers, uh, vertical conveyors, even feeder and even door control system, or even just an index drive. Um, just kind of, you know, pushing something around, even baggage handling where you have, you know, um, a diverter that just go from A to B, you know, and then back to A to and then B. Um, then when we move up into in terms of complexity, then you start to have these coordinations where axes are working together, uh, together with either one axis or multiple axes where they're completing some kind of task. Uh, so these applications like cross cut, uh, cross cutter, flying shear, uh, these are more kind of high speed, and um, it doesn't have to be high speed, but it's multiple synchronous ax axes working together. Um, and then if you kind of go up to the, another level, um, you have what we call the path inter interpolation, the mostly handling applications, especially robots. That's where you see you have like a two D roll picker, scar robot, articular arms where they're mostly for handling pick and place. They're picking um, you know, stuff up and then they're moving into a 3D you know, car Cartesian space and then you know, go into another position. So that gets a little bit more complex um, there. So that's kind of how I like to start talking about motion control applications. So once you have that in mind, you know, kind of coming back to how does Siemens motion control really fit with all the application out there? So if you look at the left-hand side, we have some of our um, most popular um, um, POCs. We have the uh, our basic S7-1200, um, and then our S7-1500, and then also our S7-1500 technology CPUs. And what we're trying to show here is what we talk about, the motion complexity, building from the simple speed and positioning to coordination to kind of like the, the handling applications. So if you look at it, even our simple 1200 basic POC, very low cost and very versatile, um, they can do positioning speed, even with our standard 1500 as well, and fail safe. Um, but then if you look at this graph a little bit more, you will see that the 1500 actually can do a little bit coordination. Yes, for simple gearing, 
Uh, it's very simple, you know, uh, simple gearing like two to one, three to one, four to one. I, I say, yes, you can definitely do it with 1500. But I usually try to tell customers when you are doing any kind of coordination between axes, you know, the first thing that you should really go to is our technology CPU in the 1500. Um, of course, with our 1500, 1500 technology CPU, you can easily scale up. You, let's say you start developing the 1500, all the, your codes, um, that thing migrates uh, to the 1500 technology CPU seamlessly. There's nothing you need to change besides the hardware. Okay. Um, so that kind of um, uh, correlates to the previous slide that you see with the motion complexity. So now we kind of take it to the other level where we can talk about our drives as well. So if you see some here on this slide, we actually show some of our drives family. So especially for the speed up to the gearing, we can look at there's two main drive family. We have a very low voltage drive family called the micro drive. And, and Sean, this can definitely be another um, um, podcast um, to talk about the, the, the Siemens drive family. But I'm just going to give a quick overview here uh, with our micro drive where this is basically the low 20 volt, 24 to 48 volt DC micro drive where it's actually safe for a human to be around. Uh, it can control basically servo motors and also stepper motors. So it's very versatile. And as you move up in terms of um, kind of um, power range, uh, you have our Synamics S210, and this is the kind of the mid range. Then you have our high end with the Synamics S120. And that kind of correlates to the uh, motion complexity that we talked about from basically speed positioning to gearing, uh, camming, and then um, handling applications, okay? Um, and as you can see here, we kind of have things laid out with uh, 1200, we call it basic controllers, then our standard 1500, these are our advanced controllers, and then we have the uh, technology CPU, which is part of our advanced controller portfolio as well for the high end, okay? so. Kind of taking that whole thing, and this is just another look of um, how the drives, um, um, in terms of its scalability, from the uh, simple to uh, from the system complexity um, to also performance. And one key thing I do want to mention, um, I don't know if you uh, uh, saw that in, in the previous slide, um, with all of our controllers, um, regardless of basic to motion controllers, even with all our drives, everything is engineering in TI portal. So you basically have one engineering tool to basically write your entire motion application, you know, sequence, everything, even the drive integration, um, they're all in one engineering tool. So I'm pretty sure um, you have heard of that over and over again, so I will not overemphasize it, um, okay? And then same thing here again, this is looking at our um, kind of like the schematic controller portfolio. But today, mainly I want to focus on the motion controller part with the S7-1500 portfolio. So what we're going to pop up here is we're going to show basically these are all the uh, different products um, that we have with the motion controller in the 1500 um, that has the technology integrated, okay? And once again, all of these are engineered in the TI portal. So, so this slide here really shows you the three form factor. This is the, the, the picture that actually tells you what this motion control looks like. And the first look, you go back, oh, you know, that one on the right hand side looks like a 1500. Yes, it is, looks like a 1500. Um, except we now have different variations of the 1500. Um, oftentimes you will find the T. Uh, stand for basically technology. And then if you get a safety one, you will get an F, so TF. And that F actually, the instead of saying, you know, uh, safety, we call it fail safe. That's why um, in our um, 1500 technology based, uh, you see the TF at the end of the um, kind of nomenclature here. And in the hardware in, uh, innovations here, we have from 1511 to 15, up to 1518. And then in the middle one, we have this is what we call dry controllers. And I'll talk more about each of these kind of um, form factor here with the um, motion controllers. Um, then the one on the left hand side here, we have what we call open controller. This is the IPC based motion controller. And all of them have safety if you do want safety. And all of them have these all of these motion control functionalities here with gearing, camming, positioning, speed, kinematics. Uh, everything that's mentioned here, even safe kinematics as well. 
and all of these are, um, especially with the uh, the uh, the Kimming editor, which I'll I'll show you actually later on, and also with our very user friendly kinematic uh, editors and trace, I'll show you as well. Uh, all those are actually built into the TI portal. Um, so the only way that you can enable those kinematics or Kimming, you do have to get a motion uh, technology uh, controller. Okay, and these are the three form factors you see here. Okay. Well, and I, I want to I want to just uh, zero in on that for a second, yep. especially for the audio audience. So while all the S7 1200 can do some simple stuff, and the S7 1500 can do a little bit more advanced stuff, you really need to get the S7 1500T or technology CPUs to do these advanced things. And with is is everything in that box that's called additional motion control functions, gearing and camming, cam profile cross PLC synchronization, kinematics, and safe kinematics, is all that T, it's T features, technology yes. CPU features. Okay, so that's the, just to make that very clear. Those are the features that you get when you upgrade from the standard uh, SM1500 to the T or technology CPU, which is, which is really a, a CPU designed for the high-end motion yeah. applications. Correct, right. and, and one key thing is, you know, the, if you know how to program a 1200 and 1500, you know how to program a 1500T CPU. It's no different if you see right here. It is consistent and, and, and the, the extensions of your programming is the same in the TCPU versus your 1500 and also your 1200 as well, because they're all under TI portal. Um, Everything's so the same, the but yes. you can do more. You can do more. Yeah, exactly. When, when, you, when you go enable it, there are certain features. If you don't have the right CPU type, they're grayed out, so it's very mm. clear that you can't you can't do it. It's not like you know. Let me go ahead and enable. Let me go ahead and try to do that. And then when you try to download, you know, to to the PLC, it says no, you cannot. No, it's very clear from the get go that it's grayed out. You don't have it, and um, so so there's no user um, confusion there. Uh, and that's one of the cool thing about TI Portal is that we're trying to make it as user friendly as possible. And you will hear me say that over and over again. It's, it's all about usability. So trying to make it as easy, simple as possible. Okay. All right. So so kind of kind of a quick um, quick summary. This is, you know, um, with the 1500 technology CPU, this is all of the motion fun function uh, functionalities out there. Uh, we, we talk about, you know, the speed, uh, you can set up a speed axis. We also can take in measurement inputs or other people like to call them probes, you know, um, you know, a lot of machinery they use probes a lot. So we we call them measurement inputs. <laughs> it caused a lot of confusion when customers say, hey, do you have probes? You know, I have tons of probes on my machine. I cannot find probes on, on your TCPU. <laughs> it, it's, it's just nomenclature here. Um, measurement inputs and then output cam tracks where these are just, you know, firing different um, um, I.O. outputs at a very synchronous time that you can basically um, program and configure. Actually, you don't even program, you just configure it. That's how user-friendly it is. Um, and then also, if you have any external encoders that you need to add for, for maybe added um, resolution, you know, position resolution out there, <clears throat> or you're trying to basically um, overcome certain machine can build you up, upgrading from a, a older machine to a new machine, and you want to add external encoder to support certain things, you know, all that can be added um, with the technology CPU, okay? Uh, we can also do cross PLC synchronous. You can talk to one 1500 to another 1500 technology CPU, okay? So you could have multiple machines talking to each other. Um, so that makes it easier, especially for OEM builders who basically designed the machine and that machine can be incorporated into a plant system wide um, kind of operation there, okay? So that makes it a little bit simpler. Um, and then, you know, the, the, for the drives, um, to bring the drives, you know, of course, we, we standardize on Profina and Profibus, but you can also bring drives via our uh, um, analog interface and also post-train outputs. We have cars that are dedicated to that, and we also have encoder cars that are dedicated that you just expand next to the 1500 um, PLCs, and then you can add those drives right in, okay? Trying to make it as simple as possible. Um, of course, with our HMI standard. Um, so I actually will go through some of these, um, you know, um, later on. So I want to jump into our kind of like the first um, form factor, which is a 1500 form factor of the technology CPU. So listed on the left-hand side here is basically all the um, 
the variation of the 1500 technology CPU. We got the 1511, 1515, 1516, and 1517. And now with our high-end 1518. Um, I use it, uh, I used to call it single Y, double Y, and triple Y. Now you can see it from the picture. I don't know if that is the <laughs> professional, yeah. Um, yeah, professional, but but it, it's really good when customer can say, okay, oh wow, this is this is a slim single Y version. This is a, because when it comes to panel, space is premium, so they, they get mm -hmm. it right away. Um, so you know that's why I call it single Y, double Y. And then as as you can know, the processing power also goes up, you know, with the 11, 15, 16, 17, 18. If you're if you're new to the Siemens nomenclature of the CPU uh, types there. Okay. Yeah, and, and that's all... important to point out. Anybody new to Siemens, the CPUs actually get faster the higher up you go. And and, and so, they get triple Y too, right? Well, they get they get they get bigger, they get wider. <laughs> but they also yeah. get faster, which is which is other PLC brands, you just get more memory. The CPU doesn't get any faster. But with Siemens, the the, the they actually get faster. Yeah. Which is which is interesting. But yeah, these um definitely something if especially if you're going with the uh, 15, 16 T and up. The space is definitely something you want to look at first. Yes, um, and actually later on, I do have a, a more kind of um, bigger slide of the layout. Basically, why is this one triple Y? Is, you know, it's it's really you know a hint there. It's really because the profit bus is on board. <laughs> they actually put a profit bus communication card in there uh, on board versus the the single Y fifteen eleven T, which you don't have the profit bus on board. Um, but if you do want it, you can add it. Um, um, Kind of looking at the kind of feature functions, I mentioned that, you know, with the uh, speed gearing came in, we actually will talk about that. Um, but the biggest thing is, you know, the, the kinematic uh, editors and the trace and the camming editor, these are all built in the TI portal and they're very graphic uh, intense, you know, with the kinematic, everything you do in 3D, right? So your visualization is actually in 3D. Um, so it makes the user, I mean, you know, when I say 3D, it looks 3D, but you don't put like a like a little kind of um, what you call those the hologram glass over your eyes and to see it. I mean, you don't do it. <laughs> now don't let me it. ask you a question. So, <laughs> yes. so if let's say I have TIA Portal, which is good for the standard S7 1500, do mm -hmm. I need a new license to be able to enable the motion features? Like, I know I need an additional license if I'm going to do fail safe. Do I need an additional license to enable motion? That is a great question. Um, you don't need an extra license. Once you have the TI portal license, um, you basically have um, the only license you need to basically to program the um, the 1500 technology CPU. Um, you do need the actual hardware, the technology uh, CPU. So if you do move from the 1500 to the 1500 technology CPU, because let's say you you your machine keep growing in complexity, right? Mm -hmm. Um, let's say you were just doing simple position moves and then you were happy with it. You say, you know what? I really want to push my machine a little bit. Uh, I want to have a more complex synchronized motion, which will uh, definitely, you know, uh, cut down my time and get better uh, uh, your outputs out there, right? You do have to move to a, a physical hardware difference from 1500 to 1500 technology CPU. However, the, the positive is that all the code, the, all the engineering code that you developed in the 1500, right? All that stay in place, okay? All that stay in place, nothing changes there. You just simply right click on your 1500 TCPU, uh, sorry, your 1500 uh, CPU and say, okay, I wanna change it to a TCP of the equivalent um, memory size and everything. And that's it, it does it for you. And you there's actually minimum time um, interruption there. So that's the scalability part, okay? And so I'm, I'm strong, I hope that that does that make sense that you know we're talking yeah. about just one license um, for TI4 to to be able to program you know um, the 1200, 1500, and also the 1500 technology CPU. Um, just another kind of quick point out is um, you know with our um, 1500 PLC the fail safe um, it's basically one thing you can select. I talk about the fail safe right the the TF the F stands for fail safe which is basically a safety PLC. So now you actually can buy um, a three PLC in one, which is basically your standard 1500 PLC, a fail-safe 1500 PLC, and a motion 1500 PLC all in one PLC. So you get three, you know, one price with three, <laughs> three functionalities there. So it's a great deal. <laughs> and 
And one of the benefits of having safety PLC that's kind of um, embedded as you know inside the uh, motion is that when there's when you, when you basically configure and program your safety PLC, safety has the highest um, priority. So let's say you push that e stop, the motion already knows you push that e stop. It knows what it needs to do to basically you know bring the coordinate axis down so you don't go into fault all the time. Um, especially if you do some extended safety function like safe limited speed, uh, which I'm not going to talk about here. Um, but let's say imagine you're doing a glass machine and this glass, you know, it's hot. You need to keep it going. So instead of shutting down the line, you can actually make it a slow speed, a slow safe speed, safe limit speed. And the machine actually with the safety and POC all built in, when you actually uh, enable that same limit of speed, the, the motion part already knows. So it knows how to coordinate that uh, without giving you any fault. I think a lot of times you see uh, a lot of our engineers um, struggle um, is that the safety and the motion constantly fight with each other <laughs> because it's two separate PLCs talking to each other. Um, so have, when you have them all in one, it makes it a little simpler. Everything is taken care of kind of in, in, in the background for you a little bit, all right? So moving on to the next form factor. So this is a very exciting form factor where we call it the open controller. And I know in the previous uh, guest with um, um, Jim Woma has actually talked about this, where it's mm -hmm. a, it's a IPC base, and the biggest thing that you can expand our IO um, in, in the back plane right there. Uh, so it makes it very compact for any anyone that's looking for a compact um, solution with um, PC base. Um, and there's a huge uh, heat sink right there. Uh, so it really takes, you know, it's industrial. And so we actually have a, a 1500 technology CPU version of this, as you see here. So you get the same motion functionalities that we mentioned in the previous, the, the gearing, the camming, the kinematics, uh, all of that, okay? All that is built into this. Um, but then now you, you basically have a, a soft PLC version, a soft PLC plus, um, Plus the window, the window base as well. So, so this is kind of the unique of the open controllers. Okay. Yeah, and just for the uh, audio audience, if you didn't catch it, what this looks like is it looks like your standard ET two hundred SP interface adapter or CPU, but but much wider. There's a big heat sink, so maybe three times the size as the normal ET two hundred SP interface adapter or controller CPU, and um. You know, because it's an open controller, you can do your C++ and other stuff, MATLAB and other stuff on it, as well as everything you would do with your normal CPU or yeah. your normal technology CPU. Yeah. And, and and the onboard USB, um, there's um, onboard USB 3.0 and 2.0 ports here as well. So you can actually, if you have some proprietary um, USB drivers or, you know, um, equipment that you developed over time, you can easily basically um, bring it into this. So that's another um, key reason why you would look at the um, the uh, PC version of the motion controller. Okay, so so moving on to the to the last form factor. So this form factor we actually call it the schematic drive controller. Uh, so this form factor, you know, um, it's not your standard POC looking form factor. Um, this one actually looks like our um, drive drive controller, um, our our dynamics drive control if you see in the middle here. But it's actually a combination of these three um, product components that I see uh, showing the slide here. It's it's a it's you know it's a three of them married together. <laughs> yeah, mm. three married together <laughs> might be crowded, but um but you have your 1500 technology CPUs plus the drive controllers. This is um, for our Synamics S120 drives. Um, and then you have our technology IO. These are, um, you know, very specific technology IO for uh, oversampling, um, for um, some kind of encoder inputs as well. Uh, so they actually, um, you know, put together all these three and basically put them all in this drive controller. Now there's two performance class with this drive controller. We have the 1504 DTF, we call it DTF, um, and then the 1507 DTF. So drive technology fail safe. Okay, and with the um, with the drive controller kind of built in, you can actually now just add the motor mod, the Synamics S120 motor, the high end Synamics S120 motor module, um, and you can basically um, place it next to it um, because it can communicate directly 
to the our um, Synamics motor modules. Uh, so it makes a very compact, um, especially if you have production machines that has very limited size and you use kind of high end um, um, drives and motors. Uh, this is a great combination to have that. Um, and the way that you program this, um, with it's exactly the same as your 1500 technology, technology CPU. So once you know how to program 1500, moving from 1500 to program the 1500 technology CPU for motion, it is a very easy track to move into. Okay. Let me ask you this. So I, this looks like a drive controller, right? So it's a <laughs> it's a CPU, but it's in a drive controller or something that looks like a drive controller. Do I still get Profinet? Can I still connect to ET200 SP distributed I/O? Yes. So um, actually, so it's just a, like a regular CPU. Yeah, that's a great segue. I'm going to actually. Uh, that's a great segue. Your question actually can take me to this. I know this slide is it's a lot to digest. It's a very technical slide, but kind of answer your question over onto the right hand side here with our dry controller. You see how many Profinet ports we have on board. Mm. We have three of, sorry, five ports total um, with three different MAC address that's available to you with the uh, dry controller. And then of course, you also have the Profibus that's with the dry controller. Um, so so hopefully that answers your question. So we have basically five Profinet ports uh, and one of them is a, is a Giga port. Um, and then you see the, the one, two, and three all highlighted in, in the green. So um, that basically means we, we have three different MAC address at your disposal, okay? Instead of you having to get another um, Ethernet card to get a different MAC address. And, and why that is very critical, if you look at our 1500 um, POC as well, you see um, with, the, with the single Y1511, um, you get two Profinet port, but they're the same MAC address. So they're basically essentially a switch, right? Mm -hmm. And you go up to 1515, you have actually three, and you have basically two MAC address. So, in that case, you can actually give that second MAC address to your, let's say if you have an IT infrastructure, right? That MAC address can be assigned to them. So in essence, you are in control. If you're an engineer doing your machine, you are in control of your whole entire um, <clears throat> machine um, um, ethernet layout via basically um, the, the first MAC address. And that second MAC address is given to your IT person. So. So basically, they basically control all the, you know, they set a lot of rules, everything. So it, it makes both worlds happy, the IT world and also the automation industrial world um, for network um, happy. Um, imagine that if you don't have that separation, they come in, they set all rules down to your field devices that even has a, you know, um, uh, basically a, a TCP IP connection in there. Um, or RJ45 connection, because they say they think that everything that with the RJ45 connection is is part of their responsibility, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you mm -hmm. you will start to have a lot of firewalls set up. You cannot you cannot see this device, see the device in your industrial setting, which is what will be driving people crazy. So that's why, and these are built in to our POCs, which is great to have that. Um, kind of coming down here, and and you can see the program memory and the data memory. You know they you know we talk about how from a single wide to triple wide, they kind of grow. Uh, especially if you look at the 1511 compared to 1518, it goes from one megabyte to 60 megabyte. <laughs> That's mm. a drastic <laughs> increase. Uh, so that 1518 is what we call a beast. <laughs> um, it, it will it will solve you know basically anything that you want to uh, any application you want to throw out there. And we have some high end customer that that basically went straight to 1518 because they know that they are covered for any future expansion. Uh, anything they they want to throw at it, they they are covered with the fifteen eighteen TF. Okay. Yeah, and the next line is what I was referring to. You can see the bit performance and just see how much yeah. faster the CPUs get the the higher you go in the catalog numbers. Correct. So you got you go from sixty nanoseconds to one nanoseconds. So yeah. sixty times fast. fast. Exactly. It's amazing. So it's, it, it lives up to is a, a beast. <laughs> um, um, I guess nickname. Um, and then kind of coming down. Um, you know, um, I mean, there's a lot more um, kind of uh, technical um, uh, resources here that's mentioned here, but you know, the, the position axis of the typical and maximum. So before I cover this, I want actually want to jump into our, our next slide, uh, which kind of talk about, uh, this is a kind of overlay, kind of rule of thumb. You know, a lot of people say, well, you know, so which CPU do I use? You know, okay, mm -hmm. I, you know, we want to give people a rule of thumb. Okay, do what? Okay, so we kind of answer, Okay, we kind of answer 
when do you use the standard 1500 versus the 1500 technology CPU? So the simple answer there is if you're doing anything coordinated, coordinated drives, coordinated access, right? I suggest all the customers to go straight into the technology CPU because in that way you are, um, you won't have to do a hardware switch. So that's a key thing. And in that way you can keep expanding, just keep pushing the, the, the limit, right? Of your machine. You know, you want to ammo stuff, improving everything. You, you're basically able to kind of continue to grow there. And then now the, the other question is, okay, within the technology CPU, which, which performance do you use? Which performance of the TCPU do you use? We talk about the three form factors, but even within the 1500 technology CPU, there's you know, single Y, double Y, and triple Y, right? What do you use? So this is a very fast rule of thumb, okay? But, but don't take this, <laughs> uh, you know, rule of thumb is just basically rule of thumb, right? To, to get into a ballpark, right? So if you are talking about just position axis, right? If you have anything less than a 10, right? Um, you can definitely do it with the 1511, okay? Um, but to keep a very high performance, right? Uh, kind of medium to high performance with a lot of kind of CPU um, um, reservation processing power, you know, five is kind of rule of thumb. So right here in the, the performance level, this is kind of rule of thumb. We do in five, you know, five, then you probably fall into the 1511T and TF if you need a fail safe. And, but if you're doing, let's say, you know, um, 70, right? Uh, that's where you kind of go up to the 1517 T and TF and not the 1516. Okay. Now these are all position axes here. Now, if you got, if you're doing anything anymore, uh, let's say 140 up to 150, you can go up to 1518. Now, if you look at the top here, it says basically the, this is basically, you can take it as a maximum um, axis or position axis. So it shows here 192 maximum position axis with the 1518 T and TF. Um, just want to kind of quickly mention that it is not the limit, 192 axis. If you if you do um, if you do a combination of our Synamics drive, which I talk about the high end S120, um, then there is actually a way for you to expand. Um, I I want to say almost um, infinite. <laughs> Wow. If you can you can go up to 500 axes, 600 axes. Of course, that, that would mean a lot of synamics, but um, you can do that because the synamics um, uh, S120 or high end, it's a smart drive. Um, it's not just, a, I hate to use the word, dumb servo, <laughs> that basically all the motion. There's a capability that's built into the synamics S120 that it can take care of its own position controller loop. Okay, so for position drives, you can actually keep increasing, and all the PLC really doing is just hey, checking on its in, you know, uh, uh, interpolated position where you're at, where you're at, maybe every 10 milliseconds, 20 milliseconds, or even 30 milliseconds. But the drive, the Snemix S120 drive, is taking care of itself. Uh, the position moves itself to get there. Um, so just want to mention that there. So the 192 axis is when you want to when you want the position control to be within the PLC. Um, but if you use our Synamics Drive S120, uh, then you can actually, you know, put that position control in the Synamics S120 and just like take care of it. And you can have pretty much a lot of those. <laughs> uh, I would I mean, pretty much limitless, unfortunately, to say. So just keep that in mind for any customers out there that's doing like a big, huge system. It's like, oh my God, I don't have a PLC here that I can do, right? You'd be like, oh my God, I'm doing 250 axes here. Uh, 1518 doesn't fit. No, we, we, we can fit. Okay, if you're using a Synamics drive. So I don't know if that, that helps or not, um, but kind of, so that's a rule of thumb. So the rule of thumb is good, but then a lot of engineers say, you know, I kind of need to know um, how much resource that, how much, you know, am I going to be okay? Because I don't want to take a rule of thumb and say, okay, I'm okay with the 1515T CPU. Um, and then when I actually go in and put in my axis, it tells me, well, I ran out of resources <laughs> or something. That's that's not a good thing, right? That is not a good thing at all. Um, we definitely want customer to feel confident which CPU type they're buying. Um, so, and how you know how big your program you can write and how fast your you know what type of you know, dynamics that your machine's going to be at. Um, so, we have a tool that's actually called TI selection tool. And this tool um, has two versions. You can actually download it, 
or you can actually do the um, the cloud version. And just you just have to go visit um, www.siemens.com slash TST, okay, for TI selection tool. You visit that website and you can download the full selection tool there, or you can just basically say, I wanna do the cloud version. And you basically go in there, you tell the selection tool, uh, that's why it says, right, how many access you have, um, and then it will tell you which CPU type is available to you, okay? And we actually have um, time for a quick demonstration of that here. Excellent, that'd be good, yeah. So here is a TI selection tool um, that I actually downloaded. And so you can, once again, you can go to www.siemens.com slash TST, downloads tool, do the cloud version of it as well. And I just want to give you a quick demonstration how easy it is to fine tune which technology CPU type that you need. So we will basically quickly go to your new device. And then we know we want a controller. And so in the controller, um, one of the key things you can do is, you know, you can click on the filters. If you don't know much about the CPU controllers that we have, you can go into the filters and you can come down here into the technology integrated. And here you can say, well, I'm doing position. I'm doing, let's say the kinematics, uh, which is uh, typically handling applications. Uh, if I click that, or I can just say, I'm doing basically synchronous operations. So right now it pinpoint me to a 1500. So I just double click that. And then down here in the special property, uh, product property here, the key thing I want people to, min uh, to see here is use motion control. Make sure you come down here and say, yes. And then based on your machine, um, if you're using standard or fail safe, let's say you do have um, fail safe application, you have an e-stop or door stop or uh, light curtains or something like that. So you would say yes. Then over, when I say yes to motion control, a tab comes up. So you, under motion control tab here, I go and select it. So this is where I can come down and say, what is my standard, uh, what is my motion control uh, functionality? So the standard motion control, this is what we talk about. If you're just doing speed, position, uh, maybe very simple gearing, that's standard motion control. Now, if you want to know more, you can click on this little eye uh, icon here uh, with the eye for more information. You click on it, and you will see that it actually goes into more detail, you know, what this selection means. Um, but since we know that we definitely are using the technology CPU with extended motion here, TCPUs here, we're going to go ahead and select that. And then down here with the motion control cycle, once again, if you click on the eye, it will tell you what this means. So typically for four to eight milliseconds, this is a medium performance uh, requirement. Um, so maybe we'll push this to, let's say eight. So, or you can, let's see, let's just type it in, eight, enter. And then I look at my machine, I say, well, I have two speed control axis, and I have maybe three index position axis there. Um, I have, two synchronous axes, that's maybe folding a box or something. Uh, let's say this is a, a, a folding box um, a machine here. And then I have basically maybe a, a 2D roll picker um, or maybe a 3D, um, a 3D kinematics here that basically wraps around the box or, some, or doing some kind of motion application here. So once I select that, so, and then if you got anything more, you can, if you got external encoders, you know, probes, or the, we mentioned measurement inputs or probes, uh, you can put all that in there. Uh, and what that will do is we'll tell you what CPU um, you can utilize. But one of the key thing is, if you look at this percentage, it tells you the utilization of the CPU. You have 42%. Um, and you can actually click on this chart here to get more details of the motion control cycle, the communication, the safety, and then the main OB here with all the utilization numbers here. So you really get um, a confidence that the CPU um, is applicable to everything that you have input in here, okay? Um, and another key thing I want to mention is, um, even sometimes when you push it, so this tool here is very conservative. <laughs> um, so anytime that the utilization goes over 65%, it basically says, hey, that CPU is not going to be recommended. So we definitely want to keep that, you know, kind of uh, conservative, like 65%, because there could be a lot, a lot of things that you're adding 
uh, OPC UA or something like that, which you can actually configure further to kind of push for. I just want to let people know that, you know, um, this is a very conservative um, estimate of the exact CPU type that you need to use for your machine. Okay. So from the demonstration here with the TI section tool, um, hopefully that kind of help you to answer um, kind of direct questions and show you how much motion resource you're utilizing and how much CPU you're utilizing. So you have a clear picture that when you go and select that, that let's say that 1515T, uh, you know that it will fit all your motion needs, okay? Um, so besides the TI selection tool, uh, we also have a lot of other informations. You know, we have basically, you know, our website on the internet. Uh, we also have tons of support, um, web, uh, support information on the, uh, for example, like our application example FAQs on the Siemens support website right here. Uh, there's also a form associated with it. We also have starter kits. We, um, we talk about the selection tool. And there's also a lot of YouTube playlists that um, relate to our motion controllers. But I want to focus in on this particular one here, the application example on our Siemens support website. And by the way, we do have an app uh, on both iOS and also Android. Um, I think you just type in Siemens industry um, um, support and you will find that app. And that app has everything in there. It's amazing how much information is jamming to the app. Um, but in this app, there's a there's a cool um, link there. Um, the link is called Motion Control Overview and Importing Links. And this um, link here, um, in this is actually constantly updated. Uh, as you see, uh, I took a screenshot of this. Uh, it's constantly updated um, by our um, my colleagues in headquarters. So you see the updates right there. So anytime they publish anything related to motion, let's say an FAQ, a new application example, or even a new firmware, or even some kind of new manual or product, it's all listed here. And it's categorized by, you know, um, by product type and by information types. So this is really a, a, a key link to, to have. Uh, so if I come back here, so this link here, and, and you can as easily go into the Siemens support website and type in um, motion control important links, and you will actually find it. Um, but there is actually a, a link as well um, embedded in this slide deck as well. Okay. And why do I can't emphasize application examples? Um, application, so here I show you know, three application examples. The first one is what we call access control. So the application example is, is the benchmark of the best practice, what we want our um, customer to utilize. Um, and they also uh, cut down a lot of your engineering time because um, we created function blocks, we created even HMI templates that you can actually utilize. Um, we create a library that you can actually bring the library into your um, application and really save a lot of time um, on, you know, you don't need to develop new code. It's already been developed. You just have to use the library, use pieces of it, and you really have your um, motion application written already. So in this access control, there is a, a basic version and then a, a advanced control version where you can basically, you have one single block to do your gearing, camming. Um, so it's kind of amazing that you can do one function, but I can use them over and over again. Um, so it's really easy to, to you know, run your diagnostic and then see all your motion logic. Um, being, and these blocks, by the way, are unlocked, meaning you can actually see the code that's written behind it if you really want to um, see the best practice, how these codes are written, okay? And then we also have another hydraulic applications here for if you have any kind of force control or, um, um, you know, variable speed pumps and valves um, for hydraulics. Um, so not just for electrical drive, but we also can control hydraulic applications now. Uh, so this application example actually shows you how, how that all works. And then the uh, third, applica uh, third application example here is um, we're showing a very cool uh, 3D roll picker uh, kinematic machine here, and it's actually writing out um, Siemens. So we actually have a G-code interpreter that's actually built into our um, technology CPU. So you can actually load um, um, lots of, um, I guess, um, CAD um, profiles in there, uh, pre-compiled and download to the um, technology CPU. And, and then the machine will just go and basically um, follow the, the, the G-code 
um, motion pad. So it's really cool <laughs> to see that. Um, and so kind of a quick follow up with the application example, um, this is just showing some of the HMI templates that's usually um, with the application example. Um, we have a lot of customers that use these um, HMI templates that's built into our application example. Um, they don't use them at all. Uh, they, they will see, they will actually look at the application example and say, oh, that is a neat way of scrolling through the access. You know, if I have 40 access, I don't want to create 40 pages. I want to create like a little kind of, you know, button that I can just go through all of them or an overview page. And in one application example, there's actually a, a neat way of having menu pull out. They go kind of similar to like your windows, they hide and come out. Uh, and he loved it. He's like, oh, I'm going to steal. I'm going to steal that. I was like, you don't need to steal. You just use it. And, <laughs> and that's your best practice. Uh, yeah, he says, I'm going to go back and tell, <laughs> I'm going to go back and tell all my engineer that, you know, I'm going to put it in there and they will blow away by it. I was like, that's why the best practice is there. You know, you can take bits and pieces of each HMI um, example. You don't need to use it all. If you do happen to like them all, use it. Because a lot of people are used to their own coloring, their own icon, and own places, right? So we cannot say, hey, use this HMI template, the whole entire thing. No, you just take bits and pieces of it. Okay. And then all these bits and pieces are already tied up to the, um, the, the tags are already connected to the function block that you're using in the library as well. So it makes the whole project very seamless and very easy to kind of kickstart it with the application examples. Okay. So changing gears a little bit. So Going back to the new well motion, when we start talking about motion controller with Siemens, we, we, we want to communicate these four core messages, okay? Um, how easy it is to program um, with the simulation, um, especially with our POC simulation for the motion part, um, and then also the safety that's integrated, and then the diagnostic, that's you know overwhelmingly configurable diagnostic. Now, we actually have a workshop that actually go through each one of these you know, key pillars here that I'm talking about, um, but you know, just one one a quick thing that I want to you know kind of kind of give you a highlights of. Um, but if you're really interested, that's where you can you know reach out to us and say, hey, I want to know more about that POC simulation that you guys talk about. You know, you can you can simulate the um, pick and place all with your POC sim without actually hardware. We actually have an exercise that takes you through it. Um, but something um, with the diagnostic part and the easier programming is the trace. Um, I know my previous um, coworker mentioned the trace that's built into our TIA portal, um, but the key thing that trace really um, comes into play a lot in motion because, you know, especially machines with the drives, <laughs> there tend to be things that go wrong all the time <laughs> and you're trying to troubleshoot. Um, and sometimes these faults only come in, what, like two o'clock in the morning. For some mm. reason, you don't know why. <laughs> yep, um, yep. And, and the big, the cool thing about the trace, the trace is actually built into your POC. It's not on your um, TI portal, um, or it's not in your laptop, wherever you're running TI portal. It is, uh, the trace is actually saving your POC, and you can set flags or trigger points, and then you can go grab basically dry perimeters or even um, POC tags or, or, or any kind of stuff that you want to grab that you think could be the issue. And when the fault occurs, you can pre-trigger and actually you know, pre-record. Uh, pre and you can have that, you know, you know, let's say the fault did happen two no o'clock in the morning. Um, somebody calls and you can just basically log online to your POC and actually see the trace. So the next thing I was gonna show you is you can actually log in via the web server of the POC, technology POC as well, and see the trace. This is from a web page of the POC. Um, so you don't need to be physically there. <laughs> which is the beauty and can be like, oh, this, you know, this, this so-and-so happened. You can actually pinpoint, at least, you know, as an engineer myself, um, you know, you always want to compartmentize where the area of, and eliminate some of the, um, where the area could be, right? So if you can pinpoint a certain area, that's where you can really get down and really figure out what is wrong, right? Or what, that's how troubleshoot works, right? So this is the, uh, this is a must-have tool. Um, you know, the, the trace that's built into PLC, and then you can view the trace via a web server that's, you know, from the PLC. This is a must have for an engineer, okay? <laughs> um, so, so we actually have a workshop, and then um, in also in that workshop, we actually take, you know, customer through, let's say if you're doing a, a CAM application. So here is a, a example of a cross sealer 
where you have two um, synchronous um, axes basically pulling down the foil, and then they're 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 pulling down to a defined um, speed and position as um, as uh, as plotted. So that's what we use a Kemp editor for. And and back to your early question, Sean. You know these are all built into a TI portal. There's no special license required to use this Kemp this editor here. Okay, okay. Yep. and in each Kemp profile. Um, so for like a mechanical engineer, they they know what I'm talking about here. When they design their their, their cam disc, um, the mechanical cam, now electronic cam in here. Um, now we actually have a cam part that you can go up to 10,000 points um, because we actually have a customer that <laughs> they, you know, in the, the previous the previous one, we can go up to basically, um, I think 5,000 points or 2,000 points. And we say, hey, just use another cam. Just use use another cam disk profile, use another one, use that. So they end up using like 50 of these, which is oh, fine. Wow. <laughs> but you know, we, we just came in and came out, came in and came out, came in. It's very seamless. And the, but then the, the other complaint is I cannot see the whole cam on, on, on one file. Well, now you can up to 10,000 points. But so if you need more than 10,000, you just do another one. And you do another one. And the TCP will actually, you know, interpolate, you know, one cam after another cam seamlessly. Okay. Uh, that's the beauty of that. And what they actually did. They actually added um, down here the diagnostic of offline online. So I'm going to actually step through some of these, um, the, the, what you will see in the chem editor. So this is a typical chem editor here where you have your working segments and you can you can input your um, working segment via basically a graphical. This is a graphical way of doing it. Or you can do it via tabular weight. You can actually put in the, the point or the line manually, okay? And for a mechanical guy, if you actually have pre-existing CAM profile that you already designed, we have a way to import it in as well, okay? And then one of the key thing I wanted to mention here is the assign of real access here. So if you do have your drive actually configured in the TI portal, you can actually assign the access that are gonna be your leading access or, and then also your um, falling access to your CAM profile. And people ask, why do I want to do that? Why do I want to take the extra step to assign my real axis? Because what that will, it will take the mechanics of your real axis there, and it will actually apply to this CAM profile. So if you do a very aggressive CAM profile, let's say you're accelerating, decelerating, accelerating, decelerating, right? You're just pushing the limit, right? You're doing something, the lines you like to push it. Um, this TI portal, when you assign it, it will actually take the the uh, mechanical limit of the real axis and apply it to your cam pro profile. So as you do that aggressive acceleration, it will actually flag and say, this is very aggressive. You might damage mm -hmm. your machine. So um, a lot of people are actually blown away by that, that we're trying to make it more user-friendly and prevent the machine from um, rip and tear. Because um, I, I heard um, this other engineer say, yeah, we, you know, we design a chem profile, we kind of go easy first and then we kind of build up, but that takes a lot of time. Why can't we just design it here and know that it will work the first time? Well, you know, that's not how it's done. But, you know, let's say, so when would you know the limit? Well, you won't know the limit until you push it. But then when you push it, let's say you, you know, then you might break something, right? So you go easy. That takes a lot of time, which we can take that time off and actually, you know, assign a real access with the mechanical limit there and let you know that your chem profile is is reaching that, you know, hey, too, is too aggressive. It, the, the, the drive cannot do it uh, without actually you having to actually test it out. Um, so a lot of engineers call, you know, let it rip. I go, please don't let it rip. <laughs> <laughs> if you're the owner of a machine, you're having a heart attack. No, don't, don't exactly. let it rip. Yeah, engineers like, oh, well, we love it. We let it rip. And then we found out, okay, that's our limit. We cannot go there anymore. Well, that's another maybe four or five hours, you know, clean level, something like that, you know, it, mm. you, we don't want to. Um, but that's why it's um, very key to have that. And then here, just more um, more capability here, where you can define the transition from a line, you know, another line to another line. What what type of pain, you know, what kind of optimization you want to have? Of course, your simplest one is just linear, right? Straight on linear. But you know, you know, there's cubic spline to make it a little bit easier on your on your mechanics. So your mechanics can last longer, uh, especially now with you know a, a lot of you know. Um, these kind of mechanical component shortage, right? You definitely want to take care of those, right? You don't want to pick something and say, hey, we can just go on eBay and buy it or go to our, our component, you know, our uh, supplier and buy it. You can, there might be a wait for that, right? Mm. Yeah. Uh, so that's another key thing to kind of consider that. Um, and then these are just, you know, more 
user friendliness where where you can actually you can actually um, use our um, uh, POC sim or POC sim advanced, which is a um, online you know simulated POC, um, and you can actually walk through your your cam profile and it will tell you which uh, status is that is it at interpolation is it at um, you know um, uh, synced is it not synced or is it error going on. Uh, you can actually do all this, you know, in your POC sim, or you can actually just download POC and then go through it and it will actually tell you what stage of Kim profile is at. So um, it's really easy. So the whole key thing here is just, and, you know, even different colors too, different color for your, <laughs> for your um, different types of um, Kim profile, your position, velocity, acceleration, jerk. This whole thing comes back to the point I'm trying to make is that I'm trying to make it very user friendly um, for the engineer to be able to, you know, uh, push the uh, push the machine um, without you know suffering the consequences, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so now switch gear to uh, you know another high end motion functionality. We actually you know in this motion motion we actually go through um, the kinematics, which is your uh, typical your handling applications. So um, people who don't know what kinematics, it, it really just it's a mechanical system in which the axes are coupled. Uh, or, inter or interconnected mechanically to each other, and they're moving around a set of working points. You know, so the typical application that people think of right right away, you know, is is pick and place. You know, pick and place. You, you know, uh, you got a bunch of joints working. You know, um, with a set of points moving. From, you know, picking up from A to B. But then, how they move from A to B, that path is really need to be defined in three D space. Right? It's got to be very precise. So, and the picture here is basically showing how they're picking up all these um, cups. Um, or instant noodles or whatever they are um, and put it into a, a, a cardboard carton, right? It's gotta be precise. And you gotta imagine that cardboard carton is also moving, it's not stopping. So the whole thing's gotta be synchronized as well. So that's the, um, the kinematics part. And so with the motion technology with the 1500, we call that kinematic technology objects. Um, and a quick uh, overview is that all kinematic, all Kinematic technology, I can go up to four interpolating axes right, right now, X, Y, and Z, and then uh, one orientation, okay? Um, we do um, plan to basically grow that in the next um, TI portal version to basically go up to, you know, five dimensions, six dimensions. Um, so that's one thing about, about Siemens. We continue to innovate to, to basically, you know, add more new features and functions to grow. Um, so currently right now, um, you will see all these uh, kinematic types that are defined here, scar robot, pick and place, roll picker, Cartesian gantry, articular arms, um, all these pictures that you see on the right hand side. So one thing I, I want to talk about here is typically how what you would go through to kind of program a, a kinematic technology objects. Okay, so the first thing you do is you, you set a technology object, kinematics, and you configure, you assign your access to it. And then when you start your configuration of technology object, you select what type what type it is. Is it a roll picker? A roll of a uh, roll picker? Is it a articular arm? So you see here, they actually show you a 3D represent, represent, representation of your kinematic type. And you can actually go in and move it around and see what you know what it looks like. And then you will assign the axis related to um, um, to the kinematic type there. Um, and then you can talk about the geometry and setup. So in, as you see in the technology object here, this is step by step uh, with a checkbox that you have configured or something like an X that you still need to go and, and maybe configure something or add something to it. So very user friendly to, to do all that. Um, but I think one of the biggest key feature about our kinematic technology object is the uh, control panel with the kin kinematic trace. So in the control panel, you can actually jog um, your, let's say your, two, your 2D roll picker that's shown right here. Um, your 2D roll picker, you can actually jog it. Um, and you, can, you actually can see that um, in the kinematic trace there, um, which is a physical rep representation of your machine to see how they actually um, move accordingly to the um, Cartesian space. And if there's any errors, if they're home or something like that, you have all that at your disposal right here. Okay. Now this is so, a screen inside a TIA portal. This is not an HMI display. This is correct. not an HMI. This is a, a a control panel that's part of the TIA portal for that access or for that for that uh, um, 
the setup, kinematic. The kinematics. Yes. Yep. So this is built in. All you gotta do is go down to the kinematic in in the project tree, and you act, you basically open it up, and you can start, you know, do do jog, uh, control panel, uh, similar to how you do with um, with drives, right? You just want to you know give it speed and see if it works. So in here, you can actually jog and home it. But another cool uh, tool here is um, there's also a lot of these kind of like um, diagnostic. Um, I guess tool tool uh, tool uh, boxes here where it tells you um, the, the the bit where it's at is it active you know if there's any errors there's any warnings of uh, you know the position feedback of your war coordinate versus machine coordinate systems so there's a lot of information which is what you need because moving in 3D is not easy <laughs> okay so so you can get a lot of diagnostic overload, but of course you can close some of these boxes here. You know, as you see the X in, in the corner, some people just say, you know, I don't need to see all that. I just need to focus on certain things. But I think one of the key things that people really love is the kinematic trace. Um, the trace tool is, <clears throat> is so crucial to, um, to when you're programming your path. When you're, when you're programming your path, uh, you want to know basically how the path actually looks like. So this is where you can actually activate the kinematic trace and it actually records the, the trace. So in here, you, you will see a red line here. That red line is what you programmed in the PLC open blocks. So you got it basically a linear and you come up and then you curve over and then you brought straight down. So you it's actually- a good visual, It gives you a visual trace of what you actually programmed in. That's very cool. Yes. So imagine an uh, application where you're putting glue, uh, uh, like apply glue onto, let's say, a semiconductor board where you have a very defined space that you need to hit or you need to mm -hmm. save some glue because of that type of glue is very expensive. You want to optimize your motion path. And you can do that inside the kinematic trace built into TI Photo without actually having to have the machine run at all. So you can have this run virtually in your PLC sim which is a, a, a virtual uh, PLC, a simulated PLC controller, um, all that without having the hardware in front of you. So all this whole thing can be simulated inside TI Photo without you having the actual machine in front of you or the actual controller in front of you. So you can continue to work on your motion path, optimize that motion path code, PLC function code, if you want to. And then when you go and basically get in front of the machine, you know, that time to commission a machine is going to be much, much less. <laughs> yeah, so, I think the visual element of seeing what you programmed in, the actual 3D path that it's going to take is super helpful. For I mean, for some people, that's going to be that's going to be very, very helpful to actually see what they put in and say, oh, did I really want to do that type of radius? Or, you know, did I want to accelerate or do I want to slow down? Or, you know, where did I want to where did I want it to go? I think that's very helpful. And and being and be able to do all this, you know, um, especially you know, uh, one thing I can mention, you know, this tool is so built for what we're going through right now. You know, a lot of people are doing remote work, right? Mm, uh, remote yep. work where you can just fine tune your, your path, you know, just you know, with the TI inside your TI portal without the actual machine or the controller. That is that is such a plus for a lot of engineers out there. And then when they go, let's say, on site to the machine, they know that they got it, they got it down. So. The time can be utilized to do something else and not trying to optimize your motion path there. So um, this is really a lot of time well spent and everything. Um, just another quick um, uh, roundup is that you can also define your um, your kind of your tool tool set points. Um, so in the area, so you, this is where you can kind of orient your tools um, and simulate your tools as well uh, for online offline uh, calibration needs. So just more uh, user capability built into the kinematic technology objects. So really, that is my last um, thing that I really want to talk about. Um, so I have here my contact information. If um, anybody that you know um, have some questions or uh, they're excited about something that I want to talk about uh, that I talked about, they want to you know ask me more. Uh, here's my contact information, and I brought the QR code. Uh, this QR code is actually my business card. Well, when you scan it, you actually get my digital business card. Since um, we don't really do a personal, uh, physical business card anymore, Sean. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but yeah. So I don't know if you have any questions. 
Um, oh, no, Kevin, that was a lot. That was a lot of great information. And for anybody listening to the audio only podcast, this may be one of those ones where you come back and maybe scrub to different sections where you want to see the different, um, you know, visualizations, um, because there's, there's a lot of good slides here, a lot of good images of um, the different features and functions. But Kevin, I just want to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedule to come on the automation podcast and bring us all up to speed on the, you know, this side of the motion control for uh, the Siemens product line. Thank you, Sean. Appreciate it. Take your time. Well, I hope you enjoyed that episode. I know I did. And I want to thank Kevin for taking time out of his busy schedule to come on the show and bring us all up to speed on the motion control capabilities of their S7 CPUs, especially the technology CPUs. With that said, if you want to learn more, check out the link in the description. And of course, if you enjoyed this episode, please give us a like and a sub. And if you're listening to the audio only edition, please consider giving us a five star review as it really helps us grow the audience as well as find new vendors to come on the show. That said, if you want to follow me or maybe support the show, you can do so over at automation.locals.com. And of course, you can always find all of my training courses over at theautomationschool.com. And with that, that's the end of this episode. I want to wish you all a very safe, happy, and healthy week. And until next time, my friends, peace.